So I think I would say there's both an institutional and an ideological development. So institutionally, the 18th century architecture survives to this day, no question about it. Gover uh, money is a, is a sovereign liability in England and in, uh, in the United States, for example. In uh, the major kind of currencies are all sovereign liabilities. That is to say, they're created uh, on the basis of government debt taken in a particular unit of account, and they hold value because people can pay their taxes in that unit of account. Um, it's also the case that those, uh, that those units of account can be multiplied by commercial banks, which in a you know, sort of longer history came on the scene, as I mentioned, in the 18th century and the, the 19th century in England. And those commercial banks are producing promises to pay um, on the basis of commitments of productivity that their borrowers make. So the money, that, so the, the, the high-powered money, as we call it today, that is based on the government's borrowing is then multiplied by commercial banks who today provide more than 95% of the money in circulation is actually the, the uh, multiplication all in this public unit of account by these commercial lenders. And they all clear in the public unit of account and they're supported, they're basically a tier built around the central bank which is supported by the government. So you have this kind of tiered system which is dependent on the government's um, stakeholder uh, authority at the center. Uh, and so, so institutionally, that architecture was put in place in the 18th century. Ideologically, I guess I would say, you know, going back to the gold standard question, we've lost the gold standard. We no longer um, have gold at the center of these systems, but the psychology of the gold standard was in many ways a psychology that an ideology meant to discipline this paper money production by uh, by looking to a matter outside of government control, which was the value of gold on international exchanges. The idea, it takes a moment to explain, but the idea was that if bank money was redeemable in gold, if too much bank money was produced, prices would rise because there were too many units of account in circulation for the same number of goods, so prices would rise. And if prices rose in paper or in gold coin for that matter, it was worth your while to take the paper cash it in, get the gold coin, and take it abroad, where it was worth more than you were getting at face value in England. So this kind of logic, you could see on the one hand how it would discipline bank money production, but it also made money look private. It made it look as if people were actually, as if trade was driving the value of money. And now that we have all these banks doing all the work making money, money itself looked private. So the whole system started to look as if private energy and private calculation and private investment was driving the money supply. And under those circumstances, it uh, was easy, especially because the authors of the gold standard, the early bullionists of the 19th century, were worried about government and were antagonistic to a large government role. Um, it's easy to forget the government role in making money, and it's easy to forget the, that money is actually a public resource and that it's made, it's undergirded you know, at the center of this tiered institution, institutional architecture is the government. So, so the ideological consequence of this, this history is that we were left with the beneficiaries of an approach to money that makes money look private, in which we think private activity is driving the whole, the whole um, dynamic. In a way, it takes us back to the beginning where we started talking. So I think that the the result of this development, of this monetary development and the monetary history and the ideology that, um, that became attached to this history was to blind us to the fact that this change in, that money is a matter of legal design and that a change in money's design had happened and that um, money as a matter of public design is a resource we should all be thinking about and we should reconsider its architecture when we run into problems, as we clearly do uh, today. So, so um, part of what we've done is we've inherited a very limited view of money um, because of the very power of the revolution that produced it.